Hey, all you cool cats and kittens, it's your favorite history teacher back at you again with another historical video. Today, we start a new period uh, towards the end. We're almost there. Uh, period eight uh, of U.S. history, AP U.S. history. And it, it's from, it covers the years 1945 to 1980. So shortly after World War II to about... Is that is that Jimmy Carter? Jimmy Carter's uh, presidency. I think Carter becomes comes before Reagan. No, oh, anyway, you don't need to know that. I mean, you do need to know that, but like 1980. I think that's just Ronald Reagan. Anywho, chapter 27, people. We are almost done with this book. We are almost done. We are almost done. We're almost done. The Cold War. So today is kind of uh, where we last, uh, I mean, in, in world history, where we last left um, is the Cold War. Uh, so this, again, should come as review. Um, and if not, you're going to learn a lot of new things today. So buckle up for the ride. All right, so origins from the Cold War. Uh, there are reasons between uh, Soviet and U.S. tensions being so high. One, uh, the Soviet Union wanted a buffer zone after World War II. They, since the year 1800, uh, they had been invaded uh, two times. Uh, one, back when uh, Napoleon tried to uh, invade with his grand army. You remember that? Good for you as well as uh, World War II, Hitler. So tired of being invaded, uh, we want some protection. And another reason why is uh, the Soviet Union felt that the US and Britain delayed opening up a second front so they could seem a little bit weaker. So, uh, you know, if you remember from last year, Stalin is very paranoid, so this is extremely plausible. Uh, you also have the Yalta Conference, which is the last meeting of the big three from the war. So Churchill, Stalin, and FDR. As we learned last year, FDR dies of a stroke shortly, I believe like a couple months after this meeting. So in this conference, Stalin agreed for free elections in Eastern Europe. I'll just leave that with an asterisk. And he promised uh, elections in Poland, as if you remember last year, uh, and uh, Pol it never came true. Poland, Poland's always been controlled either by Germany, by Russia. So in Yalta, uh, Stalin also said that, he, that his country would join the UN and Germany would be divided into four separate zones of occupation. There's a picture of Napoleon. And here's Churchill, FDR, and Stalin. All right, so you have the Potsdam Conference, July 1945. And this is right before the war ends. Uh, Japan was given an ultimatum to surrender. Uh, also, likewise, new president, Harry Truman, uh, hinted to Stalin about this new weapon. And Stalin, uh, or Truman, wanted to hold Stalin to their agreements at Yalta. He saw it as a pact. So if, if things go down, remember, you said you were going to invade um, or you were going to get close to Japan and uh, start invading. And that's what happened. So also at this time, you have the Chinese Civil War. If you remember, it started before World War II. But then when Japan invaded China, they stopped and they started to resist the Japanese invaders. And then shortly after the war ends, they resume their war. And you have the Nationalists versus Communists. Nationalists led by Chiang Kai-shek or Jiang Zixi. 
and you have the communists led by Mao, Mao Zedong, Mao Zedong. Uh, and the U.S. supported, well, the nationalists because hello, they're not going to support communists, especially not at this time. So another term we are familiar with is containment. And it was uh, this containment policy was thought of by George Kennan. And he believed the Soviet threat of expansion should be, quote, contained. So let it be where it is, but let it stay there. Keep it contained. Don't let it expand. Okay. And there are going to be two forms of containment shortly after the war. You're going to have what's called the Truman Doctrine. The $400 million in aid to Turkey and Greece that were being subverted by communist uh, factions in these countries because Britain no longer had the money to help support them because Britain was war-torn after the war. And the United States saw that as an important uh, strategic location, and they said, uh, no, we're going we're gonna to intervene. So that's called the Truman Doctrine. And then the Marshall Plan is $12 million in economic aid to Europe to help rebuild um, and keep democracy strong. Because that was another, another uh, foreign policy goal is if communism seems to spread, seems to flourish in hard times and we don't want that. Let's build up our countries. Let's build up our democracies. Build up our trading partners, and then we'll get that money back. You know. Mm -hmm. You also have the National Security Act, which created the Department of Defense, the CIA, and it increased the powers of the president. Who you know, Thomas Jefferson will be crawling in his grave right now, right? So here's a new three. I I don't, I don't know if I call them the new big three, but that's the um. I forget his name. That's the uh, Great Britain's new prime minister, Truman Stalin. That's George Kennan. And this is the propaganda propaganda poster for uh, the uh, Marshall Plan. Whatever the weather, we must move together. Farce. All right, collapse of peace. Berlin blockade shortly after World War II, 1948. Stalin cut off all roads and trains going to Berlin. And remember, Berlin's the capital. Berlin's in the eastern sphere. Berlin is in the sphere controlled by Soviet Union. So without getting aid to West Berlin, uh, that was controlled you know, by Britain, the United States, and France. The U.S. provided food, goods, et cetera, to the citizens of West Berlin in what's known as the Berlin Airlift, where it lasted over all... all a little over a year, uh, around the clock, 24 hours, dropping care packages. Uh, and this leads to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, still around today. It was the first peacetime alliance in United States history. Uh, so now we're no longer being isolated. We're going to join the fight. And the quote of NATO is an attack on one is an attack on all. So if anyone was attacked, they would... Uh, gather up some troops and get ready to fight. Uh, the Soviet Union later responded in the 50s with their version of the communist Warsaw Pact where all the communist countries got together and said, listen, if we get attacked, you're all joining us. No ifs, ands, or buts. 1949 was a bad year for US foreign policy. It was the fall of China where China became completely communist. And the Soviet Union detonated its own nuclear bomb. And for all the shtick that uh, the Soviet Union gets from the United States and being, oh my gosh, what the heck? I'm trying to move my, my little taskbar so I can see, you know? Um, for all the shtick that the Soviet Union and former Russian Empire, Russia, whatever you want to call it, um, for being backwards, well, they certainly were able to uh, come up with a plan to detonate a bomb. So uh, that's going to lead to NSC 68, know this, know this policy, which is going to urge 
the United States to have a more aggressive foreign policy and increase defense spending. Oh boy, does it increase defense spending. Here's a, here's a airplane full of milk about to be dropped on Berlin. Instead of a bomb, it's a bomb of milk, milk. All right, so why was the economy better um, post? I need to highlight this, sorry about that. I don't know why I didn't have it. You can tell I just edited it. it. <clears throat> so uh, this this very may well be a possible you know short answer question DBQ whatever you want to call it. But why was the economy better post World War II than post World War One? Well, uh, the consumer demand was high, little spending during the war. Remember, everyone had to ration. You also have the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, aka the GI Bill which gave loans and economic aid to veterans who were returning to the war if they wanted to, because that's kind of, you know, the military, join the military and we'll pay for your school kind of deal. Uh, and now you're getting your school paid for through this uh, GI Bill. Farmers get economic aid uh, and just war veterans, right? Because their nickname is GIs. Women, Blacks, and Hispanics were pushed out of the job for the returning white soldiers. Sorry. Uh, Truman's Fair Deal, kind of a continuation from FDR's New Deal. And in it, he proposed more Social Security increasement, increasement, that's not even the word, an increased minimum wage, national insurance program, national health insurance, as we know. That's fictional because we don't have it to this day. Um, but the biggest success came in raising the minimum wage and housing. Then you have the Taft-Hartley Act, which was passed over Truman's veto. Remember, we need two-thirds of Congress to override a veto. And it limited the power of unions. Uh, and it's going to outlaw these closed shop practices, meaning businesses had, were required to hire union members only so it got it gets rid of that and it kind of this kind of hurts unions it's a blow to unions all right there's harry truman all right american society and politics after the war election 1948 uh there's a newspaper clipping uh that called the election for uh dewey uh who was truman's opponent in the 1948 election and uh, Dewey, Dewey doesn't win. Uh, and um, Truman will win, obviously. Uh, and on his campaign trail, he's going to do the same thing uh, William Jennings Bryan did in the election of 1896. He's going to campaign via railroad. Um, but Truman did not achieve many gains in civil rights. He will propose a lot of legislation, but Southern congressmen are not going to support his plans. Uh, and his plans were a couple examples, federal protection of black rights and abolishing poll taxes. You have Executive Order 9981 in 1948, which desegregated the military. So we'll see the first fight uh, in the military, desegregated military in 19... Or, Korean War, get out of here. So here are all the states that, uh, all the blue states are what uh, Truman won. Yeah, there's no, there no way. No way Dewey is gonna win. So the Korean War, quick synopsis. Uh, June 1950, North Korea invaded South Korea. They almost took over the entire South Korean country. And it was called the they're pushed all the way to the Pusan perimeter. Truman saw this invasion as an act by the Soviet Union. So from NSC 68, the U.S. drastically increased its military size and spending. We just talked about that. Eventually, North Korea will be pushed back beyond the 38th parallel line. Remember, the 38th parallel line is what separated North and South Korea following World War II. Uh, China will intervene on November 25th. Uh, 1950 on behalf of North Korea because with the help of General MacArthur's sneak attack, 
uh, he was able to push uh, North Koreans back beyond the Yalu River and into Chinese territory. And that's what, uh, I guess, tags in the Chinese to attack. General MacArthur wanted to fight a large-scale war and attack the Chinese and use nuclear bombs on the Chinese. MacArthur will uh, criticize publicly uh, Truman's plans. And Truman, being the commander-in-chief, gets rid of his top general. Truman fired MacArthur. A lot of drama, a lot of drama. So July 1953, Ike, I, uh, President Dwight D. Eisenhower agreed to a division of North Korea at the 38th parallel, including a demilitarized zone. As we know, it is a um, armistice. A treaty would is still and would not be signed. Uh, and there were 36, almost 37,000 Americans that were killed and over 103,000 Americans wounded. There's a 38th parallel. Okay, so uh, the crusade against subversion, you have HUAC. Um, this is kind of the second Red Scare in America. You know, there was a first Red Scare following World War I. There was a second Red Scare following World War II. Uh, it's called, HUAC is called the House Committee on Un-American Activities. The prominent member was Richard Nixon, not Joseph McCarthy. Don't get it twisted. And what they did is they investigated, you know, suspected uh, communist tendencies in the government. Uh, one such man, Alger Hiss, uh, who was a one-time aide to FDR, he was accused of sharing 65 classified documents oh, with the Soviets or Soviet suspected spies. Uh, he was indicted and sentenced for five years in jail for perjury. Um, and in that case, the statute of limitations kind of expired, but, you know, he was convicted of lying under oath. So, you know, kind of did it. You have the Hollywood 10, or 10 screenwriters that refused to testify before HUAC. They were sentenced to jail and they would be blacklisted. So no one would want to touch them, no one would want to hire them. Many activities during this time period became associated with communism, declining religious sentiment, increased sexual freedom and agitation for civil rights. You have Truman's loyalty program. He issued an executive order 9835 for federal employees to take a loyalty oath. Loyalty, loyalty, loyalty. And those people that didn't either quit or were fired. Um, you had to pledge allegiance to the American government that you weren't a spy. You have the McCarran Internal Security Act, which required communist organizations to register with the government. That's Alger Hiss. So last slide, crusade against subversion. You have the Rosenbergs, a couple, husband and wife, Julius and Ethel, were convicted of giving atomic bomb secrets to the Soviets. It was only re real revealed in 2008 that the prosecution knew Ethel was innocent. And so they were uh, you know, trying to get a confession out of Julius. He didn't budge. And both of them were executed. And then... We talked about this as well last year. McCarthyism, he's seen as a demagogue. A demagogue is a leader that capitalizes on prejudices and false claims to gain power. Joseph McCarthy, Republican from Wisconsin. Uh, he accuses about 250 State Department employees, officials of being communists, although he never proved a single one. And this is going to go on for a couple of years, people. It's not going to be just a one-stop shop. This is going to go on for a couple of years, and his downfall is going to happen when he attacked the army on uh, national TV, and many people uh, saw him as a big old bully. And uh, he's going to he's going to die he's going to die in poverty uh, because he's going to go to drinking and become an alcoholic shortly thereafter in his life. Anywho. Uh, Arthur Miller's The Crucible about the Salem Witch Trials is actually an allegory to McCarthyism, which he was writing about at that time. So, you know, a little a little critique of uh, McCarthyism during that time. So here you have Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, and that's Senator John McCarthy. And that is the end of this presentation. Chapter 27, The Cold War. Most, much of this was a review, I hope, for some of you, actually most of you, 
Uh, so, you know, I love a cold war. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this presentation. If you did, hit that like button for your boy. And as always, stay safe, wash your hands. Peace.